Have you ever felt hopelessly lovestruck? Like the phrase, I can't get you out of my head is painfully real. You can't control your own thoughts. Have you ever felt trapped in an obsession with somebody that you can't be with? Maybe you don't even really like them anymore, but somehow you can't give up hope. If so, you know the pain of limerence, an altered state of mind that feels like you're addicted to another person. In this video, I'm gonna lay out what's actually happening in our brains as limerence deepens from giddy infatuation to an obsessive fixation and then a state of desperation. Hi, my name is Tom Bellamy and I'm a neuroscientist and writer and I blog all about limerence at livingwithlimerence.com. I'm also the author of the book Smitten that explains how neuroscience can help us make sense of obsessive infatuation and to recover from it. Right, let's get to the bottom of whether it really is possible to be addicted to a person. Okay, a good place to start is with definitions. What is addiction? Well, if you look in a dictionary, it's something along the lines of an inability to stop doing or using something, especially something harmful. And our, our kind of general social understanding of addiction is exactly that. It's a habit or a, a compulsion that we can't stop even though it's disrupting our lives and it's having a negative impact on us. Now there's a lot of debate and a lot of contention about exactly what addiction is at a sort of physical level. So perhaps the extreme uh, forms of this on a spectrum would be people that perhaps just say, well, it's just you've got weak will. Okay, you just lack the self-discipline to do what you should do. The other end of this spectrum might be addiction is a disease of the brain. There is literally a malfunction going on within the brain. It's out of the addict's control whether or not they can stop this behaviour. I think most people think that addiction lies somewhere between these extremes. So they would look on it as being certainly a state where self-control is impaired but perhaps neither entirely about discipline, but also probably not an irreversible disease of the brain that can't be recovered from. Perhaps the simplest definition of addiction is an irresistible wanting. And there's a great quote uh, that illustrates this principle, I think originally comes from uh, William James's classic Principles of Psychology from the 19th century. Were a keg of rum in one corner of a room and were a cannon constantly discharging balls between me and it, I could not refrain from passing before that cannon in order to get at the rum. So this addict is aware that they would risk death to satisfy the craving. That's how strong a compulsion it is. If we were to list a series of symptoms that are associated with addiction, it would be things like insatiable desires, cravings, compulsive behavior that's difficult to resist, intrusive thoughts that just come unbidden and make you think about you know, what you're addicted to, mood swings, uh, and generally a state of sort of psychological restlessness and distress until you've secured whatever it is that you're addicted to. And there's some sort of secondary symptoms as well associated with the addict's life. So things like neglect of other responsibilities, perhaps a habit of secrecy, telling lies, keeping secrets, concealing their habits, and generally prioritizing that addiction over everything else in their life. Now, I've been talking in fairly general terms so far, but most of what we know when it comes to the neuroscience of addiction is associated with drugs of addiction, drugs of abuse and alcohol. So substances that we know we can become addicted to. Now they directly disrupt the function of the brain. Specifically, the reward systems and the arousal systems in the brain are targeted by most of the drugs that you would know, so things like heroin and cocaine, amphetamines and alcohol. And generally speaking, these drugs work either by directly activating receptors in the pleasure and reward centers of the brain, or by preventing the clearance of the neurotransmitters, dopamine and noradrenaline. So I spoke about the neuroscience of uh, reward and arousal in a previous video. So I'll put a card up on the screen here if you want to go into more detail. But basically these drugs of abuse directly derange the action and the activity 
within those pathways. And so it's not too surprising that people can lose control and lose regulation of that drug-seeking behaviour. But there is another class of addictions known as behavioural or process addictions. So the idea here is that it's the same reward pathways getting overactivated, but by a natural stimulus. The best known and certainly the best well characterized and the only example of a behavioral addiction within the DSM, so the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for, for Psychiatry, is gambling addiction. So this is obviously characterized by a compulsion to keep gambling even when you're losing money, you're jeopardizing your security, you're jeopardizing your health, you're jeopardizing your relationships, but you keep gambling compulsively as a consequence of how rewarding the experience of winning is to you. But there have been lots of other behavioral or process addictions proposed. So things like shopping addictions or gaming addictions or love or sex addictions. Uh, a modern one, of course, is social media addiction and compulsive use of social media. But the overall idea is that highly arousing or stimulating activities will give a natural high and it's possible to become addicted to that natural high. Now I'm arguing that limerence fits this model. The massive euphoric high of limerence is so powerful that it's easy to understand how you could become addicted to seeking more of that kind of reward. So for limerence, it's contact with that other person, your limerent object that gives you a natural high. Consequently, you can get into a state where you crave that contact and you crave reciprocation of romantic feeling from them. Limerence get incessant thoughts about their limerent object. The last time they were with them, what they're going to say the next time with them, fantasizing about possible scenarios. A lot of your mental energy is occupied by your limerent object when you're in the thick of person addiction. You have enhanced incentive salience for your limerent object. Everything in the environment reminds you of them. So things that they own, their coat, their car, their coffee cup, whatever, has special significance and resonance for you but also it becomes hard to listen to love songs or read books or everything without immediately thinking about your limerent object. So there's lots of cues in the environment that make you think about them continually. Limerents often experience as well an escalating need. So they need more contact, they need stronger contact, they tend to escalate their boundary testing behavior to try and get a response out of their limerent object to get the same kind of high that they enjoyed early on. And overall, this behavior can, be, can feel certainly involuntary, compulsive, and again, many limerents are secretive about it. So they're not honest about their feelings. It's a private secret that they use to regulate their mood and give them a kind of illicit hit, just like an addict using a drug. So what's going on in the brain whilst this process of transition from just euphoria and excitement into compulsion, fixation and craving is going on? Well, it's all about the reward system and that reward system that's being driven by dopamine. So that cluster of cells in the ventral tegmental area projecting to the nucleus accumbens and signaling reward and predicting reward, recognizing reward. But there's another projection into the prefrontal cortex that helps provide context for the reward. And that helps in the learned association between environmental cues, so things like seeing their belongings or hearing a love song, and the desire to seek that reward. Now, as time goes on and you've learned the association between your limerent object and reward, that process, that signaling loop, begins to become a habit. So instead of continually signaling up to the prefrontal cortex and receiving feedback from the prefrontal cortex, there's actually a loop that can happen at a subcortical level. So within what's known as the striatum, where you develop that habit of reward seeking before you're even really conscious of what you're doing. There's kind of a subcortical autopilot program running 
where you feel an impulse to seek the reward before you've even really started thinking about what you're doing. Now in humans there is a specific region in the cortex that integrates all of these processes of understanding reward, finding the context of reward, linking it to cues, taking that sensory input from your eyes and your ears and you know scrutinizing the environment and assessing how powerful is the reward, how pleasurable is it, how much should you want it. And that region is known as the orbitofrontal cortex and that provides that feedback loop to reduce the urgency of desire or to regulate the urgency of desire. And in addiction, there is a dysregulation, perhaps you could call it an instability within that feedback system. So dopamine is driving the desire, wanting to pursue your limerent object. And that dopamine drive uh, undergoes a process known as sensitization. It becomes stronger. So once you've realized how rewarding your limerent object is, that wanting drive sensitizes and becomes very powerful. At the same time, the feedback regulation from the executive center desensitizes, so that weakens. So you end up with a runaway habit loop where Pursuing your limerent object and getting reward sensitizes the dopamine drive and weakens the executive feedback. The more that you do this, the more that you pursue your limerent object seeking rewards, the more you'll behaviorally reinforce that process. So you'll strengthen the wanting drive and weaken the feedback drive. Ultimately, that leads to a state where you feel like you've got a loss of self-control. The impulse to seek your limerent object is so powerful that you act before thinking. And it becomes very hard work, very cognitively demanding to try and intervene and stop yourself from pursuing that habit loop. So what might this look like in real life? So let's take the scenario of somebody who's become limerent and they're into that fixation phase where they're not able to control their feelings too well. So let's say our hero is reading a book and they read something in the book that triggers an intrusive thought about their limerent object. So immediately that person's image pops into their mind's eye and they have an intense urge to seek them or seek some form of contact with them. So let's say that urge is to go and check the Facebook page of their limerent object. So the limerent is probably going to feel a sense that they shouldn't do this, that they know that this isn't good for them, that this isn't a healthy behavior, it isn't a healthy habit, but they also kind of already know from a growing strength of desire that they're not going to be able to resist the urge. So that's almost like the executive brain shouting into the void, a, a little whisper of a voice coming back saying, this isn't good for you, you shouldn't do this. But the strength of the desire coming up from those subcortical regions, the very deep you know, animal parts of our brain, the brain stem is impelling us. They know that they're not going to be able to resist, that they're going to give in to this desire. So they then fire at Facebook and start looking and they will get illicit pleasure from seeing photos of their limerent object. That will give a sense of fleeting relief, but the desire is not really weakened. It's only a temporary reprieve until the next time that an intrusive thought breaks through their concentration, breaks their focus and impels them to try and seek some kind of contact with their limerent object again. So when limerence gets into this late stage, it is characterized by things like involuntary urges, intrusive thoughts and a kind of learned helplessness about that executive control. It's almost like, you know, your mental CEO is off on a holiday and they're no longer in charge of the situation. Also, um, unfortunately, this uh, phase of limerence will be associated with kind of diminishing payoffs from when you do get contact with your limerent object. Like for all addictions, eventually the high does begin to fade 
and it's like you have to seek even stronger dose or a stronger contact to get the same kind of relief that you used to and that's another big transition it's more about the relief from the sensation of craving than it is pleasure in the actual contact with the limerent object finally uh, another unpleasant and unwelcome symptom is withdrawal pain when trying to detach so coming off an addiction is associated with withdrawal pain and behavioral addictions are just the same it's really uncomfortable and distressing to try and break contact with a limerent object that you're addicted to okay so that's all rather demoralizing we're thinking about how our brain has uh, through behavioral reinforcement and learning got into this state where the wanting drive is extremely powerful and the feedback control is weak what can be done how can we deal with it if we ever find ourselves in that sort of situation well basically simply you need to reverse those effects so you need to disrupt that limerent object seeking habit loop so when you get that subconscious urge when you get that drive to seek them you need to recognize it as a habit loop that you need to break so you need to disrupt that sequence of a cue triggering the desire to seek and then going and indulging in the behavior that gives you relief and somehow disrupt that habit loop and break it the second thing that you need to do is try and break the association between your limerent object and reward now that might seem impossible because this person is so remarkably attractive so you know unnaturally powerfully desirable that how could you ever not find their company rewarding well there are ways to do this there are psychological tricks that you can use to try and weaken that association between your limerent object and reward a lot of what makes them so desirable is just going on in your head it isn't really about them you are projecting your desires your romantic needs onto them and so it's happening in your head that means you can disrupt it you can change it the third thing that you need to do is to exercise your executive mind so train that orbitofrontal cortex to give the appropriate amount of feedback and try and develop and strengthen a habit of self-discipline just like exercising a muscle the more you get um, used to doing that in other contexts in terms of controlling other unhealthy habits the benefits begin to ripple out and you'll find that the ability to control cravings and the ability to regulate emotions in increases across the board. And finally, to deal with the demoralization of this, you also need to find new sources of reward. You can't just deprive yourself of the uh, habit that you were using to sustain your mood and to regulate your emotions. You need to find a new healthy source of reward a better habit to pursue so something that gives you a, a different natural high a different natural reward but is healthy and helps you actually fulfill your life goals so there's a lot in that obviously it's not a small matter to reverse an addiction when it comes to limerence i actually have uh, written a, an ebook which is free if you sign up at my website so i'll put the link down below so that free ebook is like a 10-step process for how to reverse and resist the habits that drive you into person addiction and how to identify potential new sources of reward that will take you forwards. So if you are in this sort of situation and looking for support, uh, check out that guide. Hopefully it can help you. So that's the reality. Following your instincts when you're in limerence really can drive you into a compulsive habit that becomes to all intents and purposes an addiction to that other person, to your limerent object. More positively, once you know that this risk exists and you have this vulnerability, you can take steps to escape before the limerence gets too fully established and becomes an addiction. For more on that, please see this video, should be a card on the screen and a link below on the five phases of limerence and how to escape before the addiction gets too severe. 
Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you want more and I'll see you next time.